full screen. Okay, so today, we're, you know, since we're talking about compression, we're talking about movement, talking about recovery and, and the flushing, I think tempo running is a good uh, part two of Richie's talk. So we all know who I am. You know, I was really a jumper first before I became a long sprinter. And I'm still trying to run at my age of 57. I'm still trying to figure it out. You're young. Yeah, I'm trying to figure it out. And you got to do it early in the age groups, as Joy knows. You got to do it when you're 55, <laughs> 56. When you're 59, you make excuses of not running. You make, oh, I can't afford it. Oh, no, I can't go. And then when you're 60, then all, you know, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> but anyway, Joy knows all about that. You got you to gotta do it. it. Those four years makes a big difference. Every year, there's an attrition, the master's running. But that's not the, not the purpose of this talk. So just really five or six quick points before you know, we get deeper into the talk. I want to talk more about the definition of the word tempo, because sprinters has a different name than mid-distance runners. I learned that many years ago when I used the word tempo. Uh, I want to talk about some classifications, which is those two documents that I uploaded. I want to know where does tempo running fit in your weekly plan? If you go hard, easy, or high, low, where do you fit the tempo in? And I think after point number four, we can talk collectively behind the science behind the benefits of tempo running. I will talk about a few, but I think we can go you know, all night on this topic. And then I'll give you some examples of some of my sample workouts and volumes of tempo. And lastly, we'll talk about the speeds. How fast should you run your tempo workouts or tempos for sprinter? So that being said, so just quickly for a mid distance, long distance runner, the word tempo means different things. And it's on the screen here. So recovery is 65 to 70%. And a true tempo run is really, you know, 90% of max heart rate. So that's the middle distance terminology, which is no one here coaching middle distance. So classification, I think everyone has seen some form of this document. And, you know, we know about speed work, mm -hmm. speed endurance, special endurance, but tempo comes in two different categories, intensive and extensive. And for this case, we're going to really focus on extensive tempo, the tempo that's used for recovery. And in this case, UK Athletics has deemed any intensity of 75% or less, which is a good, um, good guideline. I like it maybe a tiny bit slower, like say 70%, but we'll figure out how fast that really is or how slow that really is. And this is further from the document. It goes into more <clears throat> detail about how often you should do tempo, the recovery times, how you should do it. And for me, the golden rule is always your training flats on grass. That's it, period. I don't care if the track, if the grass is wet, you do it on the grass. I, I hate seeing people do tempo on a rubber track and God forbid, I hate seeing people do tempo on asphalt. Um, I had to do it at McGill when we had no indoor track. We did our tempos under the stadium stands on asphalt, minus 10 weather, but you know, you do what Ugh. you have to do. Yeah, oh, it was awful. McGill was awful <laughs> when I was there, uh, but we did our tempo on asphalt, on snow, on ice, on, on salt, on sand. But it was recovery. You don't go, you go maybe 60%, 50%. Okay. You just, you're there to move. You're there for the flushing of, mm -hmm. of the hard workouts. So what is a fit annual plan? Okay, well, I'm a long sprinter. If you're a thrower or other events, this, this is where it fits in in your program. I won't go into um, more detail. I can if you want. I mean, I can. I know in the GPP phase, I do a lot of tempo and as i get more towards the competitive phase i do it only as needed really i don't do as much as now say for example in october november and this is again more more detailed theory which i won't get into but uh it's a good article if you get a chance to look at it i think i think half of you here who are british or uk know this document but it's good good reading so where does it fit in? Well, I spent nine years of my life training with, you know, coach Dennis Barrett at McGill. And we did the three times a week hard or mm -hmm. high. And I was Monday, Wednesday, Friday were my hard days. I hated Mondays. Mondays was always, you know, like three times 500 or split 700s. Uh, I always 
try to find a reason to skip it like jury duty or dental <laughs> appointments and but no i that was monday but the thing is tuesday thursday and saturday were usually tempo days and i'll get to the specifics of the workout saturday when i was trying to move up to 800 meters and that was a Oh. a non-successful experiment oh. <laughs> I, I had to do a 300 uh sorry a 30 minute run on saturdays but i always made sure i did my tempo after i did six or eight strides of 100 meters on grass with flats just to get the legs uh flushed out moving there's always the the old expression that distance running kills your stride distance running shortens your stride you'll lose your speed if you run long distance and hearing those kind of things back in the 80s um, is the reason why we did tempo after we did 600 meters going faster and faster each time. So that's the, what I did when I was at open and McGill during my college years, when I was working out with, uh, Kevin Tyler, when I was in Vancouver, I was 37 years old. I was sub masters with sub masters back then. Now it's masters because it's 37 mm -hmm. and Kevin's now I didn't try to follow Kevin's program because he had like Shane Nimi and you know and later he had Tyler Christopher and all those guys but he did a Monday Wednesday Friday Saturday workout so they did speed Monday speed Wednesday and Friday Saturday was again speed with a special endurance on a Saturday they did back to back on a Friday Saturday mm -hmm. and the reasoning behind that was because it was a different energy system mm -hmm. they've always believed in being fresh for your speed workouts and when I say speed, it was either A, uh, acceleration development, or B, max velocity. It was always one or the other, or a combination of both, um, like segment runs, you know, like- Can I ask, 30, can I ask a question? What's the three X sure. on the first one and four X on two X? Uh, four uh, hard sessions a week, three hard oh, or three, three, okay. three high, three high, three hard sessions, All right. and then uh, and four X. So uh, the funny part at McGill, I remember I was in uh, physiology and I had to take one course and it was like a seven hour lab. It was from noon to seven. And I purposely took that class on a Tuesday or Thursday because I wanted to reserve my Monday, Wednesday, Friday for speed sessions. I didn't want to yeah. do track practice, which was five to seven, right? Mm -hmm. Come on, you get your priorities right, right? You're there for sports mm -hmm. first and school second. So I had to purposely wait like a year to find this organic chemistry class that was held on a Thursday. And <laughs> I had permission, I had permission from Dennis to say, yeah, look, I got class at 12 or seven. So I would get to school at 10, do my tempo workout and, you know, shower, eat, and then get to my lab at 12 to seven. So, so that was the, uh, my, my reasoning for tempo, but masters on the far right, again, I do now, I, I can only do two days a week hard. And in this case, I like Wednesday and Saturday only because on Saturday, um, I have unlimited time. Monday through Friday, you know, I still, you know, work, have a day job. I can't take two hours for lunch or after work because it's pitch dark at 4.30 now. So mm -hmm. Saturday is usually my day for a hard workout. And this is how I, I do it. Uh, Sunday, I use what I call active recovery. So I'll either go for a long walk along a golf course with my wife. I'll do something active. I'll do movement. I'll find something to move, but I do want to move. I don't want to sit down all day and, and, and veg out. I do need to do something. Mm -hmm. And this is the, uh, the weekly plan. So that's high level of how I structure it. Um, okay. So the science behind tempo running, and, and I like to talk about this a bit more later as a group. You know, people use the term active recovery. It could be gardening, walking. Uh, some people use the term tempo for fitness. So mm -hmm. I've seen people do like 10 times 100 and they'll do push-ups on one end and sit-ups on the other end. Mm -hmm. Somehow the word fitness and aerobic capacity all comes in handy. Uh, it's always mixed up together. I've heard the term round management, right? Joey, we know this from, uh, from Italy or yeah, Italy when we had four yeah. rounds in three days, right? Yeah. Once you have 80 people, 81 people or more registered, uh, you have four rounds for the sprints. And it means on this, the middle day, you have your uh, quarterfinal, semifinals on the same day. So people talk about tempo running is good for round management. Mm -hmm. um, people say it's good for recovery from walking back from a hard 30. Mm -hmm. uh, usually for me, it's five minutes. For some reason, when I do six times 30, no matter mm -hmm. what I do, you know, if I pick my nose or look at my phone, mm -hmm. I go back to the start line. It's always five minutes, no matter what. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm just conditioned, but yeah. maybe five minutes is my magic number. Mm -hmm. um and then talk 
lots of talk about better circulation, better capillaries. Uh, some, well, for those who are fortunate to run at Olympic and world level, you need to stay warm from the call room to the starting blocks. And the worst thing, and for me, the worst thing I don't like about the new rules is they make you take your clothes, your warm up clothes off before entering the stadium. Yep. That, that to me is asinine. I, I, yep. I, and, uh, and, and when it's raining, and I've seen this at World, I've seen this at the World Relays, I don't know why they do that. I know why they do that. It saves time. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've seen at Dartmouth College indoors where they didn't use blocks indoors for the oval meets, oval events, because of time. So wow. I've run many, I, may, I run many 200s and 400s indoors at Dartmouth with no blocks because it takes time to set up. Uh, anyway, that's beside the point. Yeah. And, but yeah, so if people say the more tempo you do, the better fitness you have and, and therefore yeah. you'll stay warmer. So this is something I like to talk more about as a group. But okay. as we talked last time, uh, well, half an hour ago, it's for me, tempo running is the best same day travel shakeout. If I fly, I land early enough. I like mm -hmm. to get to the track and do a quick shakeout run, you know, shakeout and even a half workout, like, like five times a hundred meters. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so that's what I do. That's the science. So just almost done here. And so some typical workouts. Okay. We all know, I think we all sort of coach track. We know, but um, 10 times hundred meters walk back or mm -hmm. jog back or uh, what Kevin and Laurie Primo did. They were called turnarounds. You run a hundred, you slow down 10 meters to a stop, turn around, walk and go. And yeah. that's, uh, and that's uh, or they call it greyhounds as well. Mm -hmm. That's brutal. Uh, 10 times 100 is brutal. <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm, I'm huffing and puffing. I usually cheat. I, I walk like 30 meters you know, and, and walk what, back 30 meters. Yeah. That's what Harry Mara used with uh, Ashton Eaton for 1500 training. Cause it's kind of hard for a decathlete to focus on it. But that was one of the things yeah. they did a lot of. Yeah. Well, this is great. And so when, with Kevin, who was influenced by Charlie Francis, so he liked doing 50 meter recovery between the runs, 100 between sets. And I put this diagram for context. So you do what one, one, that? one. What are those so do, numbers? So, okay. So it's one, one, one. So you do 100 meters, uh -huh. walk 50. Oh, yeah. 100, walk 50, 100. So that's one, one, one. Oh, that's, okay. And then, and then you do 100 meter. Then you do a hundred meter uh, break or, or recovery. Right. Then you do 100, walk 50, 200, like back and forth, walk 50, 100, walk 50, 100. And then you take a hundred meter break. And then you do one, two, two, one. So, you know, so you get the picture and it's, it's 2,100 meters, about 2,000. And uh, it's tough actually. I found the first time doing this, it was tough. Especially the two hundreds, because you got to go uh, a, a turnaround. You do a hundred meter quiz. Is that what the two is? I don't get it. The two a uh, two hundred meters is a hundred meter turnaround. You do a hundred meter. You slow down quickly. Yeah. Turn around. Right. And go a hundred again. That's right. a two hundred. Oh, sorry. Wait. Go that's back. it. That's a two hundred. So, okay. Oh. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. That, yeah. That's I'll, I'll draw it up better next time. I'll do it better. I'll do it with different colors and different. Uh, specifics but uh -huh. the reason why i put this up because this is what was posted when i was getting to you on, on you know you go to the workout that's the wall that's your workout you know one on one oh. one two two one one and then later yeah, he would i just say, know that that looks good yeah then then later he would just say the big circuit okay and then you knew what it was so that's okay. one of them and and one of the more famous ones that i started doing uh when i had access to a real indoor gym oh yeah yeah it was called the woodway curve treadmill i love that mm -hmm. machine uh, I wish I could afford it. I'd buy one tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And what I like to do is what I call the EMOM, every minute on minute. Mm -hmm. And I use a gym boss phone app and, or even a device. And you know, I have it here too. And you do 20, 40. So you run 20 seconds mm -hmm. really quick. And then you do 40 seconds walking. Mm -hmm. And then it'll beep at 20. So you do 20, 10, 20, 40, 20, 40. Mm -hmm. And you do your 10 times 100 that way. And it's a nice workout, nice flushing workout and a lot less pounding than being on a grass or asphalt for that matter. Yeah. And that's the Woodway Curve Treadmill. And that's one of my favorite workouts. I get, could I, you, yeah. you could do that on a, a bike too, if you're, if you don't know that. Yeah. Yeah. I like, like elliptical. Yeah. We do them yeah. on elliptical. 
Yeah. You could. I, I like to be as specific as possible. Like even I yeah, do weights. Yeah. I, put, I like to try to stand up and do weights as much as possible. Even like hamstring curls. Mm -hmm. I prefer standing up because I run standing up. Oh yeah. No, that's <laughs> yeah, good thinking. That's handy. Yeah. So that's that's what I do. So it's just some workouts. A lot more variations. Um, here's some more variations just because I'm a okay. historian who used to work for the IAAF NSA before they canned us and not, not bitter about that yep. at all, but uh, no, no bitterness involved. <laughs> so, you know, Tom Wait. Tellez, everyone knows Tom Tellez. Yeah. Uh, so his, his, so his workout was like six times 200, 29 seconds with 90 second recovery. Mm -hmm. So this is like week one. So, oh, sorry. That's week one. And then the week after, he cuts it down to 75 seconds. Mm. And then week three, 60. Then week four, he makes it one second faster. Mm -hmm. But back in ID. And then and there's proof here. There's this video link, which I'll send you the slide deck after. This link proves and shows Mike Marsh and Carl Lewis doing this exact workout on, in, yeah, on Japanese. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, but how cool. fast is 29 seconds? Like when I first did this, when I was, at, when I was training at Cal Berkeley back in 2000, yeah. Um, I, did this, I did this workout with, with Matt, Matt Bogdanowitz, a uh, good friend from, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Matt. And yeah. we did this and I said 29 seconds. And I said, right, okay, that's 29 seconds. Uh, unfortunately, Carl and Mike Marsh PVs are like 20 seconds or 19.72 to be exact, <laughs> uh, 0.73 for that matter. And, and so 20 by 28 seconds is 71%. And at the time I was doing this, I was, my PB was 23 seconds. I was 37 years old. So no wonder I felt like crap doing this workout. This to me, <laughs> this to me is ex, uh, intensive tempo, right? For Carl yeah. and Mike, it's in, uh, extensive tempo. So anyway, have some fun with his story uh, workouts here. Okay, volumes. Now, uh, two more slides here. The sweet spot for me is 2000 meters. I don't know why, it's a nice number, 2000 meters. Um, but for Kevin, Tyler, he was getting us to do six thousand meters 6k of tempo so monday wednesday friday we would be doing um three uh, sorry up to 3k 3000 meters per session oh. uh, twice a week just because sorry three uh, three thousand twice a week only because um he felt that the quarter milers needed more more volume or mm -hmm. you know all the reasons we talked about in the past slides so i didn't like 3000 meters per session I mean, 2,000 meters is easier. That could be 10 times 200. That can be 7 times 300. I just didn't respond to 3,000. I was showing up the next day tired. Mm -hmm. So everyone has a sweet spot. And for me, it was 2,000 meters. Mm -hmm. And maybe today as a 57-year-old Masters, maybe that should be down to 1,500 or even 1,000 meters per session. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the volume. Mm -hmm. So, And then the last thing is speed. It's the very last slide I have is speed. So if you think... 75% is your speed for extensive tempo. Well, if your PB is 12 seconds, I always allow one second for acceleration. So I subtract uh, one second and then I divide by 0.75 and that's 14.6. Mm -hmm. And that's an easy to time because on football fields, you have goal post or end post and you mm -hmm. can easily time yourself and see if you're going too fast, too slow. Um, so this is just a way to calculate your speed. But one thing I heard from Mike Hurst who's our um, friend down in Australia, he explained to me the term, quote unquote, coming home speed. And Kathy Freeman did that. And I go, what does coming home speed mean? You know? And yeah. she, she says that she never runs slower than race pace in practice. So for her, in her, her 400 meter world record splits or her personal best record, um, if 25.5 is her second 200, that's her coming home speed. And that means her, tempo speeds is rarely less than uh, or slower than 13 seconds with a running start because 26 by two is 13. So 13 seconds is quite quick compared to yeah. up here, right? Well, that's Kathy Freeman. So yeah, different program, different coach, different genetics, different everything. Um, but this is kind of how we model our, our tempo. And those two links, in the chat are the two documents I'm referring to. And if you want to know more about extensive and intensive tempo, uh, Jim Heiserman wrote a couple of good articles on it uh, eight years ago, and you can find that on the blog. And that is it, guys. Uh, thank you for my monologue. I, I do want to go back 
to this slide here or any questions about tempo and then maybe yep. we can talk more about the science behind tempo. Yeah, I've got one, Jensen. You're saying about doing it on grass. I'm certainly not doing it on tarmac or asphalt. Fair enough. But bear in mind, I'm up in Scotland here and running on grass, even today, you need flippers, not running shoes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not wet, it's just muddy. So would you do it on a treadmill rather than doing an asphalt? I would do, if I had the money today, I would get a Woodway curved treadmill. Oh yeah. That is what I 100% recommend. Yeah. And I would do EMOMs all the time. I do 10 times 100, 20 times 100. Yeah. Uh, Limits the pounding, yeah. good cushioning. Why? Yeah, I was able, yeah. Yeah, I, I can do 2,000 meters, 2, meters easily without getting injured on, on Woodway. Your, your well, workouts well, that you did, I think right before this, Go back to where you had your three times four. Yeah. So when you were in, um, I guess you said you're at McGill doing that. I mean, I, I looked at that first and then I looked at Kevin's and I was like, okay, that makes more sense to me. Because the first one is when you're working on speed, you're pretty fried by then. It would seem. Yep. I mean, it's, you know, speed early in the week or, you know, some kind of, but that, I mean, that just didn't make sense to me there. Did the second one, feel a whole lot better when you start doing this the speed with the tempo between them the speed endurance at the end well i was young naive and stupid and 23 years old when i was at mcgill so uh, i just listened to whatever the coach posted on that board yeah and yeah by friday i was fried our friday workout is resembled more like a like a pietro menea high volume high intensity kind of workout and only the strong yeah. survive there's a lot well, of that was also a time when that was pretty standard doing the, a yeah. lot of special endurance, speed endurance, and then okay, well, now we can do some, a little bit of speed later on. I mean, it wasn't speed focused, it, it wasn't based on speed and max velocity first, and then adding endurance to it like it is, like it became later on, I guess. Well, well Dennis was coached in the US, he went to Austin Pay in Texas, he went to Tennessee State, I think. So he was heavily influenced by the US. Well, Austin Pay's in Tennessee. Tennessee, right? That's it. So the yeah. other one was, yeah, sorry. So same, he came from that background. That's why they believe in just a lot of high volume. But unfortunately, when I got to this group here, I was 37, way past my prime and, and having a day job and trying to just run master's track because I you know, heard about that. And uh, this was hard. Uh, it was, was better. It felt better, but it was very hard. I, I uh, just, it's all about volume and intensity at the end of the day. Really, it's how much volume, how much intensity, uh, which is why the Masters one is makes more sense today. Because yeah, but on a yearly training plan, you would vary this, correct? Yeah, absolutely. It depends on yeah. your background and what year you want in, in your in your uh, training site in your yeah training cycle. So what you're showing us in this slide would be at what phase in your training? This is probably. Um, competition before pre-competition so the purpose pre of the slide is to, is to show where tempo fits in really I, I oh no i know i know yeah yeah but it was really pre-comp yeah okay. definitely pre-comp like november uh, october yeah by december we were doing this november maybe november december we were definitely doing this and once we were indoors in january absolutely we were doing doing this and i can i have workouts and logs and i can tell you some of the you know so what workouts. was what was the purpose behind the tempo well, like what did the about, coach tell you? Yeah. All these reasons here, everything I've heard over the years, act, uh, not active recovery. That's a new term I heard in the last 20 years, as opposed to 40 years. It was all about fitness, all about recovery from the rounds. It's all about doing, you know, four events in three hours at a national meet or doing seven events in like work capacity. Kind of. Yeah. Work capacity. Exactly. You know, I, I did long jump, triple jump, four by two, four by four and the 300 and the 60. Right. I did six events in, in a weekend. And so all that, well, I guess it helped. It only helped because I, we, I was injury free. If you're not, if you get injured, game over, you must have pack it up. But those who survived, those who were healthy, you know, ran, ran well. I'm not trying to brag, but it was all about attrition. You can survive this. You can survive anything. Sounds like you one, thing on the, about... one thing on the intensity, Jimson. Yeah. Saying about. 71% or 
But the, oh, they were 400 no. meter runner. It's at the percentage of your 100 meter max, i.e., your absolute max speed, or 70% of your 400 meter time divided by four. Yeah, good, good question. It was more on, I think, the, the 200 speed. I think we took an average. We, so, yeah, so if your 200 was, well, I think mine was 22 back in college. So we just divide by two and divide by, but we always take one second off for, for the acceleration, the acceleration. out of the blocks. Yeah, yeah. So here's another question for yourself and uh, maybe Kevin, anybody else coaching sprinters? And I'm talking 100, 200 meter sprinters here more specifically. If you're doing winter training and say you're doing 180s, 150s, 160s, there is a fatigue factor between the 100 and 200 meters of most people. Mm -hmm. What would you base, say you're running 90% or 93%, do you base on your 200 meters divided by 1.5 or your 100 meters times 1.5? Because one doesn't take in the fact of fatigue and the other one, it knows the fact of fatigue. So you're somewhere in between to get the correct times. Well, well I think today with technology, if I was one thing I would add extra is a heart rate monitor. Because if I find whatever value you mentioned, if I find the heart rate is still kind of high, I would say, just slow it down a bit. You know, if, 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 if 14 seconds is too, too hard for you on a, on a tempo, you know, make it 15 seconds, right? Mm -hmm. I'd rather save themselves for the hard days or the high days. And tempo is tempo, right? Tempo is just recovery. I was actually talk sorry. I was actually talking about hard days and faster oh, days. Oh, you're talking oh, about that, yeah. trains, your 100 meter time. About speed and endurance. Oh, yeah, speed, oh, oh okay, that one. Because well, I yeah that. I, I think, mean, if I you're. Think, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, it's you know if you're, if you're like one one sixty one fifty one sixty maybe a little bit if you're, I mean my view is if it's two hundred meters. And there's somebody running 100, but they're really more of a 200 meter runner. You work on that, you know, that raw speed, that's going to help in the 200. So I would even say, you know, if you're doing 120s, 130s, maybe, maybe even 150s, you base it on the 100 meter, you know, the percentage of the 100 meter. If you're doing it with a little more recovery, and if you're doing more, you know, speed endurance uh, for the 200 meters, but you're doing 160, 170 meters worth you maybe cut the recovery down, do more volume of it with less recovery and base it on the 200 meter speed where you're getting a little more of the, the, you know, the strength there. I don't know, just an idea. Yeah I, yeah, I get that. And I've tried that up to a point, Richard, but the thing being, if you've got a 100 meter runner and I'm talking my 17, 18 year old, 11.7 female runner. So that is 100% max 11.70 for 100 meters. She doesn't have that to take into a 110 to a 120 because it's a big fatiguing factor now or a 130. So I can't multiply the 11.7 by 1.3 and get an accurate target time for a 130 because there's too much fatigue going on between 85 meters and now 130. That's 55 meters of fatigue. So it just doesn't work. But then if I take it as a 1.3, so 2.6 of the 200 meters, that's too easy. Yeah. Because she's running at slightly less tempo or speed doing a 200. Just figure it from both directions. To, Literally sorry. figure it from the 100 meter direction, what your pace would be, figure it from the 200 and then go in between. Yeah. If it's, go in between there, yeah. I mean, just pick some and try it and see how it works out, you know. Yeah, I've, tried, I've written out a table of that. I just wondered if anybody had a more. Yeah. I, I always go with the event you're trying for. So if you're a 100 meter sprinter, go based on your 100 meter time. And, and if you're a 400 meter sprinter, go on that time. Just as Again, closest to the, the event. Yeah. yeah. The problem is 100 meters always do 200 and vice versa, don't they? It's from a coaching point of view, it's just a nightmare. Never mind. Yeah. I'm just stuff. thinking about volume, guys. You got to also be careful. Okay, we're talking about tempo, we're talking about recovery, but when you're looking at a, a whole week's program or a, a micro cycle, you got to look at the volume that's being amassed too, because that's going to affect the body, not just the intensity. We can vary the intensity, light, medium, yeah. high, but I think the accumulation of so much work is 
or volume is what actually can add to the fatigue factor with a lot of people. You know, oh, so you yeah. got, I'm thinking with tempo, like we did tempo in rowing too, but our tempo in rowing was more or less, uh, we would, instead of doing 2000 meters, we'd do a thousand meters, but also we take down the volume, but we would, uh, in, in, in that we would also take down our heart rates. Our heart rates will go while we're doing our tempo. We were looking at our heart rates to be about 110 beats per minute, just, you know, slightly, well, maybe 20 beats higher than, than resting and stuff like this, because the whole idea with tempo with rowing was a full recovery in between the next, uh, uh, in between the next training session. Yeah, we use right. more, I'd say, and we've got the same age as, as um, um, you know, Alan's talking about, but we do more, I think we do more of the, the work capacity, the aerobic element, the general fitness. We hit that daily with a really long progressive dynamic warm up and striding and things and a, and a dynamic warm down and kind of the, the whole residual of that in the whole week and the month and the three and four months, you get in pretty good shape in general from doing that. And it's not as hard. I mean, by the end of a warm, if it's a sprint day that day, by the end of the warm up, you're doing some really high intensity stuff, maybe if it's leading sprinting, but all the other stuff we're doing is, you know, overall adding to that fitness and adding that component. And then we may do one really good, you know, and recovery might be like Nico's saying, recovery might be lighter, more like, you know, 100 meter grass strides, uh, both after maybe a hard workout, like we're doing special endurance or something like that, speed endurance. We get on the grass, maybe even barefoot and go across the field or down the full length of a football field and doing, you know, good, relaxed, uh, you know, striding, good, relaxed, skipping, maybe things like that. And, and doing that to, that's not as much pounding and not as much overall workload and fatigue, but more just movement. But one thing that I like when you're talking about the 400 meter runners, you know, doing like 3000 meters worth, one of the things we do with our, all of our sprinters, especially 200, 400, 300 hurdlers is, is if it's, and it's kind of like a tempo workout, I guess, but it's really simple. They do maybe start off early in the year doing six of them, then maybe later on doing eight of them. And maybe for some of them doing 10 of them, you know, later on when they're better shape or they're older and more mature. And we call them 300s every two minutes. And you do eight 300s and you start every two minutes. Well, how fast are we run? I said, just good form. You know, maybe if you run it in 60 seconds, you get six seconds rest. If you run it in 55, you get 65. So if you run it in 70 seconds, you get 50 seconds rest. And they do it on the grass right inside the track. And it's it's more of a self-paced and it's recovery, it's tempo. And, uh, you know, they just make sure they start every two minutes on it. And that's that's kind of the one real tempo when we do. But uh, like with our kids that are like the ones that Alan's got that age, you know, we do a lot of high intensity sprint stuff and power stuff and acceleration stuff. And so, and with speed endurance workouts, we may do in others. Yeah, I just don't. I don't want to necessarily do a whole lot more. Of course, I only have some of these for three months, so they're not all year round, but doing a whole lot more tempo without doing it on a bike or an elliptical or a treadmill is kind of really hard on the system. Because for me, tempo basically means <clears throat> controlled, relaxed activity. Is that not it? I mean, that's what it was in rowing. It's, it's where I'd like to jump in, if I might. Oh, Just, for sure. <laughs> as, as, as I listen to all this, I could stand back and say, by definition, with everything that's been said, anything that's done at a constant pace is tempo. Yeah. I, just, just by definition. And so if, if I can kind of work backwards through my thoughts while I was listening to all this, when I you know, work with marathon runners, long distance runners, um, and, and when I read now that people are doing a one hour recovery run, no, they're not, you know, I, I think if you're doing something up to 30 minutes, that might be a recovery. So when you see one hour recovery, I, to me, that's, that just doesn't make any sense with 
any of my folk, you know, when they've been out for an hour, been out for 90 minutes, they would come back and it'd usually be on the grass on the infield of the track and they would run six, eight, 10, 100. We called them turn rounds, but you kind of came to a stop and turn around and came back purely because if you spent an hour or 90 minutes just that same very restrictive movement in, in the lower limb and, 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 and then, of course, through the hips and the knees, you wanted them to come back and stretch out and, and change their stride. When I think about what we would, did with our sprinters at Florida State, we would use tempo after our lifting weight strength sessions. Uh, we would come out, you know, we were lucky the weight room's right next to the track. We would come out and they'd basically run a diagonal uh, across the infield, what, whatever that, and then just walk and run back. And, and again, anywhere six to eight to 10, that, at least to me at that time, met, met the definition of recovery. Mm -hmm. um, so when, I, and again, I, I, you know, it, it, this is a view. I, I don't have anything to stand on. When I looked at, the workouts that were shown as intensive and extensive tempo for, for, for the sprinters that, that Jimson showed, I recognized the extensive one. I mean, I understand the two terms, but that to me was tempo. The intensive one was a different workout altogether. I, you know, to me, that was, that was training something different. And like special then I think just a final word. Pardon me? It's more like I'm special. Sorry, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then, and I think there was a, the, just a comment about the idea of, of what Kathy Freeman, did, you know, this, this coming home speed. Typically, if you if you think of the hundred and the two hundred as kind of the same events training wise, the four hundred is really the first event that you can break down and run faster than your race pace. Yeah, you know, with hundred and two hundred you're stuck. You, you, you can't run any faster than you. I mean, we do assisted stuff, but you can't run any faster than flat out. Mm -hmm. Starting with the 400 and then up through everything else, you can break uh, your workout down in, in, into repetitions and run those faster um, th th than you're going to race. Um, just, just my observations from the last uh, half hour or so. Hour. It's tempo to me from rowing was always when our coach used to say tempo days, it was nice, relaxed strokes on the water, heart rate, not gone higher than, a, than 150 beats, 140 and just take it tempo. That was it. Nice, constant pace. You know? I used the term flushing. I used the word flushing when someone non track yeah. person yeah. asked me, what are you doing yeah. today? I'm doing tempo. I'm like, what's that? Uh, I just say uh, it's a flushing workout. Yeah, but that, that that's what tempo is, correct? Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, but that's the other term I use. Did it also other... have on that, that first file that you put up there, did it also have tempo for throwers? Yeah, I saw that. Because I was thinking of Tom and, and uh, Peter, and the, uh, my tempo for discus throwers is you throw, you walk out, pick up your disc, you walk back. That's one rep. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've been all over Peter recently that he should run more. I think he has his athletes run, but I'm not sure he. Are runs. you saying that he's fat, Malcolm? Pardon me. Are you saying that Peter's put on weight? No, yeah. I, I, I run after every session. He's the wrong size, and he has the wrong amount of strength for what he has to compete in. <laughs> oh my God! That if that wasn't if that if that wasn't a. Uh, Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. You, you can explain that, Peter. I'm, I'm happy to listen to your version. <laughs> yeah, yes, it. set it up and I'll explain it. Yeah, he, he means I'm not tall enough. Oh. <laughs> no, gotcha. I, I, I think, you know, for what he, you know, as you, the, the master's people know, as you go through the age group, the, you know, the weights of the, the uh, implements and whatever get smaller. And th there's a limit to how much strength you can use in that event. So why be stronger than the event needs? And then because Peter used to be a runner, in you know, my tiny mind, it should be easy for him to run. But again, as he's bolted out as a thrower, he, he had done less and less running. And, and he's doing more now. But 
Yeah. I'm always going to see. The other thing about the running is as you get in your master's years, it, there's just quite a bit of wear and tear, but plus a few, a couple of knee operations later, I've got to watch, you know, how much I do. I can, I'm okay for say yeah. 60 meter turn rounds. I can do, I can do a couple of those for you. And, uh, and then, <laughs> but you, and, know, you know, yeah. but you know, what's the real interesting thing is uh, we need to talk about volume. Cause I think that's what's the one big difference from when we were young where we are now, you know, as master athletes. Oh, yeah. And I think the one thing that we have to really look at is how much is too much with regards to our bodies. And, and we need to factor that, in, that the whole concept of uh, volume into our workouts uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, I'll talk uh, for next week, Nico. You're, I volunteer you next week to discuss. Uh, so <laughs> one further on this, and this is uh, Wolfgang Ritzdorf always talks about this. I mean, the usual, the usual dialogue is intensity and volume, intensity and volume. Okay, or maybe density. You know how often density, you, yeah. And and he says none of those really matter without the most important one, and that is quality. Yes whether you're a thrower, a jumper, a sprinter, even a distant quality. So you want, and especially as you get older, mm. for one, you don't need to do as much of that background work unless you've gone, you know, taken two years off. But, you know, when you're getting to be our age, and most of us are getting to be up there in that age, you don't, you know, that you have to limit the volume, get the right intensity and make it good quality. Because if it's not good quality, it's not helping either the other two and it's beating up your system. If it's too much volume, if it's just volume and there's not much intensity and there's not much quality, I mean, you can get away with that when you're 25, but not when you're 55. <clears throat> because you got to look at fatigue. That's you another look at factor. structural fatigue, not just yeah. your Oh yeah, <laughs> for sure. And it's, it's also recovery takes so much longer <laughs> as you get it's older. When you hear some of the, 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 what I would call the top level masters, and, and maybe Jimson experienced this, you know, when they're just moving into that 40, 45 age group, that you'll, you'll hear them talk about they can still do maybe one session a week that they did at their peak. It just takes them longer to re recover. So they, they've still got all the mechanicals to, to, to be able to, to do that. You're still wired. Yeah. 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 Yeah, by, by well, it's also at Berkeley. Yeah. When I was in Berkeley training th from age 39 to 40 or 37 to 40, I was still able to do my workouts from, from way back then. But the next morning, I'd be like, hell, I just yeah. like, exhausted. <laughs> yeah. And that and that has to do with volume, I mean, muscle volume. Because as, and I, I know I, I'll probably get chastised for this again, but we know that we lose 10% of muscle mass per decade after the age of 40. So the thing is, Muscle is um, a tissue that actually is your highest source of zinc as well. And zinc is something that's very, very important uh, for recovery. And when we lose that muscle mass, we are losing a huge storage of that very important element in our body, which is another reason why we're not uh, recovering as much. Talk for next week. Any suggestions for next week? That topic? Or the volume topic. You need to get off the aging topic. That's making me depressed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> volume, no? I can tell you all, all of you what you have to look forward to. Don't worry. <laughs> well, I, before my hip got really bad a couple of years ago, I had a kid. We were we tilted the basket up because he was pretty. He was about a 6'4", six, 6'6", six, six jumper, but he was tall. And we'd make the basket higher. You'd take a little soft, squishy ball in his hand and you'd do like five step, six step runs up and jam it. And we'd make it higher and higher, trying to get him better on spun ultimate and converting up instead of diving through. And he put it back down. He goes, well, can you, can you touch the net? I was like, come on, I can still touch the rim. And I took off once and I touched the rim and I came down he goes, are you all right? I said, yeah, jumping is easy. It's the landing that sucks. <laughs> I felt great jumping, but when I landed, oh my God, I couldn't walk for a week after that. Yeah. So as long as you, if you hang up, hang on the rim, I'm fine, but man. You still got that zip in there, and maybe you have less muscle mass, but it's just everything up the cushioning, the, the zinc loss. Well, just, just think about it. Uh, you're running along on, uh, let's say, 
a certain level and then there's a two foot drop. When we were young, we used to take that two foot drop without even thinking about it. Now we come up there and we look at that two foot drop and we're deciding, am I going to land with my left leg? Am I going to land with my right leg? Can I land with both legs? And what has happened to us that has changed our mindset it is always baffled. Preservation. <laughs> No, but think about it. You're changing your, the percep not the perception, but you, your mind has changed that now you're more, how do you say, uh, cautious of taking that two foot jump. What is it? What has changed? Self-preservation. When you don't land it, healing, healing takes longer. Uh, true. The healing takes longer, but I mean, do you do you know what I'm getting at? When we were young, yeah, jump here, jump there. Now I'm even if I have to step down two feet, or anything, obviously two feet, and I'm thinking, do I step down with my right side? Do I step down with my left side? Can I jump? It's because when you're young, you haven't experienced pain, and each uh, time you get injured, your memory or subconscious kick it back up, going, "This is going to hurt. Be careful." So that could that's be a, it too. The self preservation mechanism. That could be it too. You know, you said before the crazy things you used to do on your bike when you were younger. Yeah. That was the same. I was thinking about this the other day. Maybe trying uh, indoor track cycling. Now, when I was 19, 17, 24, I would go at 45 kilometers an hour around an indoor hard concrete track. No problem. Yep. Yep. I ain't going to do it tomorrow, I can assure you. Yeah. Because I know if I come off that bike, something's going to break and it wouldn't be the bike. <laughs> but the thing <laughs> is, at what time, what and this is this is very important because I've been I've been pondering this thought every time I get on my bike. At what time in our lives do we make that switch where now it's just like, wait a sec, you, you, it becomes more of a thought process before a doing process. Hey, before yeah, it was a doing process without a thought. Yeah. I think one thing that affected me a lot was when I and I coach. I'd been an athlete. I'd coach kids for years. Then when I had my own, I was probably to, you know following them around, make sure they don't fall. So I was more aware of them and what happens to them. And like you know, my twenty-five year old now at one and a half went down the back little stairs out the side on his little big wheel and did a face plant and cut everywhere. And and they were stitching him up, and I was just like. He was in pain, but I was in worse pain watching him. So I think that made me more aware of things. And, and uh, I don't know. It's that uh, awareness that's really because, I mean, you think about it, you're still running, you're still jumping, but you think before you jump, you think before. And even on my <laughs> bike, the, the thought process of on my bike when I is, is changed how I'm cycling. Well, I, t I, I think I may have told Kevin this, but before my surgery, I was so limited in my mobility and my, my bike was messed up. A friend was fixing it over the pandemic and my son's bike had a high rail from the handlebars to the seat. And I had my helmet on, thank goodness. And I reached my better leg up to get over it and lean back. And right when there, I was like, okay, I'm falling and there's nothing I can do. And I whacked against my wife's car, but I had my helmet on. I nailed my knee with the bike. I get up. I'm like, okay, usually you get, you know, you got hit by a car on your bike or you, you yeah, a, I know. Or you hit a gravel and you slide and you fall down. You hit no, I fell off my bike standing up trying to get on it. That's when you know things are getting bad. I did that once in front of a farmer on a country road in Peterborough, Ontario. I got lost and I was asking him for some, so I was asking him for directions and he's trying to give me directions. And I realized that I was clipped into my bike and I'm in the front of his hood and all of a sudden he's giving me directions. I went plop because I couldn't get out of my cleats. No, but I mean, this is something that, uh, uh, you know, even masters, masters runners, like there's got, there seems to be, I think, something innately that changes in us, innately changes in us, that's stupid, it's the same thing. Something in us that just changes, that makes us more cautious. I, I think we become more aware, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. of, of the consequences, um, you know, in the middle of your activity. What, I mean, what's your motivation to do the, to do the activity? You know, if your motivation is, you know, health and, and general fitness, 
okay, I'm going to be a little more hesitant. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take this jump. Um, but if you're in a competitive situation, you, you know, you, you don't think so much about that. I mean, I, I remember growing up and, you know, when I was on my motorcycles, um, you know, didn't even think twice about if I saw a jump, you know, the, the saying was, I mean, when in doubt, you just give it, give it more gas. <laughs> and, you know, because, uh, you know, it's, if, if the back end of whatever you're doing is going to be bad, most of the time, it's probably better to be going a little bit faster, you know, and, and kind of blow through the end of it rather than to come up short on a jump, you know, or do something like that, you know, and I mean, hesitation, um, you know, I grew up doing a lot of extreme stuff and, um, and, and it's still, and it's still in me a little bit, you know, hes hesitation can, can really cause problems. This would be an interesting talk if we can get to extreme sports athletes and ask them, do they lose that edge? And when, at, at a certain age. Yeah. A little bit like coaching young pole vaulters. They kind of get hesitant. I was like, you know, okay, here's the thing. If you just put your hands up and take off aggressively, where you're holding, you're going to move the pole and the pit. It's going to be safe. Is it going to be perfect? No, but well, we can work with it. And getting them that notion that the more hesitant you are, the more dangerous it is. You know, and that's the only, I mean, if you're a little more hesitant in the high jump, when well, you hit the bar, you land on the pit. If you're a little more hesitant in the long jump, no big deal. If you're a little more hesitant in the throw, you don't hit somebody else. In the vault, you know, it's, it's a, and hurdles. If you're hesitant and scared of going over the hurdles, that hurdle's going to grab you. If you're a little more aggressive and you hit the hurdle, it'll go, it'll fall over and you'll be okay. So I think it's kind of what Kevin's talking about. We, I deal with that a lot with young kids with vault and hurdles is err on the side of being aggressive because you're better off walking away from it rather than landing on your head or, you know, busting yourself up. Tim, Tim wants to say something, but he's muted. <laughs> I, I think, you're muted, Tim. Yeah. Unmute yourself, Tim. There yeah. you go. Now, so I, I'm wondering, is there, there's a fear factor, a factor of being fearful. And at the age of adulthood, when does that come in? I think we talked about that, but I really think, Richie, you were, you were alluding to this, the fact that when I had children, all of a sudden, damn, I did not go 80 miles an hour on the turnpike anymore. And all of a sudden, all those stupid things that I did nine months before, all of a sudden stopped <laughs> because it was not about me being preserved. It was about preserving someone else. And I wonder if, if you know, Tom, I don't know if you have kids or anything, but like any, anybody who doesn't have kids, did, does that still happen to you? Do you get to a point where like you're 27, 28 and you stop doing stupid stuff? I don't, I don't think I have any, but... Um... <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I still behave like one. So like, I've like I've got like a little bruise on my elbow there from yeah. falling off my bike yeah. a few days ago. And then I don't know if you my ankle. Uh, oh no, we don't want to. Oh my god! Wow. Yeah. Hey, let me let me tell you a funny story about a bike. Oof. About a, a year ago, I thought to myself, I'm still falling off my bike. Oh, no, you're going to love this. I'm 57 years old. I'm 50, I'm 59 years, 58 years old. And I, I'm crazy. And this is why I'm saying what has changed in me. I'm riding my bike uh, down a park, Tommy Thompson Park here in Toronto. And all of a sudden, this grandiose idea comes to my head of, hey, I wonder if I can take that speed bump without holding on to my handlebars. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And guess what happened? <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> uh, the thing, so the, fun, the one thing that went through my head as I'm falling <clears throat> to the ground is, what the fuck were you thinking? <laughs> the athletic trainer that helps me with a lot of stuff has been on winter team staff. His favorite comment is, I can't fix stupid. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just, the, think, just that fear factor. Like the, I think that, perhaps... Perhaps um, coming back to the, the Masters athletes and you, particularly in the explosive events, you target your competitions and you have a, you perhaps have a, a longer preparation and you target those competitions. So you don't do that. You don't do as many as you would have done when you were 25. You, True. You, well, obviously, but you just, you, cause you know, you know, you know, you know you're not going to recover. In, in your training sessions you target these things and they'll probably 
I think we'll probably perhaps Jim's who can answer this, but I, I think looking at maybe the, the the master sprinters, depending on their age, they'll probably look at maybe two meetings a year out of four a year, two in two indoors, two outdoors that they'll rip target and they'll be at the national champs and, and, and one of the um, either the European or the world's. Yeah, everyone's yeah, everyone's different. Everybody, yeah, everybody's different work capacity. But yeah, I, I know I know the people who you're talking about. Uh, yeah. and some people just like to compete, like Joy. She's always competing. She just loves competing, win or lose, right? So and some people can handle it better than, yeah. you know, than others. Well, it's like it's like decathletes. I mean, you know, you got a decathlete who's 21 years old and good shape. They're not gonna, they can't do one every weekend. But like Kevin Brian, when he was like, you know. 21 22 years old how many did he do with the season and after, and in summer and then when he was at the end of his career how many did he do a year oh yeah and you know all that changes recovery changes um you know you know i mean we we've talked about it i mean you know with training age you know and maturity um you know things things get adjusted um you know it, jumping jumping's hard jumping's hard on the body and you know, as athletes age, as decathletes, but, you know, if we're talking about decathletes, you know, the jumps is, you know, kind of the first, one of the first things that kind of goes on them, you know, and you got to get smarter, you know, with where you implement that training, because it, it, I mean, it is, it is hard on the bodies as they get older. I mean, you know, it seems funny. We're talking about older athletes, you know, that are 30, 31 years old, but um, <laughs> That's you, know, you have to take into account that, you know, that recovery and, and again, the intensity and the volume that the, the, the training takes. So then the question is, does it become more of a, besides the physical, which we know our bodies are being limited as we age, does it then become more, does it have more of a component of a psychological yeah. uh, aspect? I think I was thinking when Kevin, when you were just talking there, Kevin, I, it was, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, maybe. Jake Arnold does like three decathlons, three weekends in a row because he keeps, he no hide it at the one in Dallas. And then he goes to, uh, no, he did, he did the one in, I guess he did the one in Ottawa and he no hide in the vault, but he does the one in Dallas and qualifies for nationals. Then like two weeks later, I mean, basically he did three decathlons in like in a month, 24 days, but he was young and could handle. You know, and I'm like, it was killing me. I mean, it was you're really going to do this, you know? Uh, anyways, I mean, it's just something to think about, guys, because it's it is it's it's always been something that's fascinated me as to what has changed in me mentally, you know, and I guess, and at what age? It goes back to something Tim was asking, I think. Because I, I work a lot with contact sports, and uh, you know, that was my background initially. And you don't play them because you're brave. You play them because you think that isn't going to happen to you. Hmm. And when you see someone get injured, and you haven't had that kind of injury yourself, it looks bad, but you have no real conception. You have no real empathy. And it, you know, I can come into a squad and I can see a group of people, and I go he's probably going to get injured through this. And these guys, 25% of them are probably going to get injured through that. And I can fix that. And none of them will be interested. Yeah, but then the only how, guys well, who when are interested, yeah, the only, this is the thing. The only guys who are interested is the guys who've been hurt. Okay, so... And you then when the he's been... Pain. Sorry? Mm. That, that's the biggest difference. I mean, you're saying about on your bike, Nico. Yeah. I did that, but my God, I must have been about 11 years mm. of age. When I, when you I grew out of it, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I grew out of it before I went to high school. I think the only <laughs> reason why I did it is because I was challenging myself to say, you know, why am I afraid to do that? Anyway. Yeah, so Alan grew out of it. Nico, yeah. what was that? <laughs> well, how, how, how recent was that, Nico? Yeah, that like, was a year ago. Like... <laughs> Tom saying, I think it's experience too, because went there about 2004, we were hiking in the Rockies and purposely slid down a glacier, just glissading down the glacier, but it kind of turned me, 
sent me into these rocks. I jammed my, the reason I had my first hip replaced because I jammed my leg in the rock, spun me around, whacked my head and major concussion, life lighted off the mountain. And ever since then, I'm like, I give this one teacher, she's like 28 years old. I was like, wear your helmet if you're biking to school. And then tell kids that at the cheerleader person a few years ago, they do these jumps on the sideline. It's like, you need mats under you. A girl, you know, a girl falls from 10 feet, but rotates backwards the acceleration. And, and I sit here and I lecture kids. If you stand there and you fall backwards right from there, just the acceleration for the farthest point, hit your head, you can die. You can get, so I feel like I'm like warning all these people about helmets and this and that, because I know as I did it. And before that, I could have cared less about anybody's helmet. Well, could it have and, been, you know, that- could it have been a last hurrah, an adrenaline rush? Because that's the one thing I think a lot of us old athletes miss <laughs> is that adrenaline rush. Come you know, on, we get, adrenaline. Yeah, but I mean, we get smarter and, um, you know, I mean, you laugh about, you know, falling over in front of a farmer. I've never, I've never, I've had my fair share of wipeouts. Never broken a bike helmet while I was moving. Mm. I've I've got my foot stuck in a pedal a couple of times and just fallen over and hit a rock and broke two helmets <laughs> and, and not moving, you know, and I've ridden, I've ridden some of the top downhill mountain bike courses in, in the country and fallen. And, but yeah, I mean, I, the, the, the two times I've actually broken a helmet. No, I was pretty much stationary and just lost my balance and, and fell up, fell over and looked around like, my first concern was better. <laughs> so, so can we end? So, we, can we end this? Can we end this yeah. discussion? Because this is a really good discussion, and so unfortunately, it's getting late for Jimson and Co. and yeah. over yeah. here. But the right question: the question is, is it that we lose the adrenaline? Oh no, we're losing the concept of the adrenaline rush because of fear. Because what? Yes. Of fear. 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 Fear, fear and yeah, common and sense. And common sense. Other part. Parents, the other you part is, is you see, see when you were younger, you were invincible. You could do weight training. You could, you could squat 185 kilos and then run the next day. See when you know your body can't do that, psychologically you must ease back a bit because you know you just can't do it anymore. Fear, fear ends up being the, a product of experience. Yeah, exactly. True. I mean, I wouldn't even load 185 kilos on the bar now. Yeah. But I used to start my workouts at 100 kilos and work up. The 100 hmm. kilos was the last part of my warm up, and then I would go up. Now I just just kind of be on with that, you know. What I mean, it's just no chance. Uh, anyways, so what should we talk about next week? I haven't let Alan do anything yet. Alan, yes, Alan, you haven't done anything yet. Yeah. Do you do you want any police versus coaching one? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, we'll do that then. Book it, Dana. Book it. Hawaii 5-0. Hey, guys, uh, um, last thing is uh, I hate being a pain, but can you guys retweet or do anything because for that course that I'm giving on the 28th of this month? Yeah. The micro-stretching? Yeah, that yeah would we'll be put it out, out again. Yeah, that would be great. May, hey, maybe email us. From, I'll send an email to everybody right now and email the stuff back to us because I don't know where I put it. I probably got it on my phone, but that'll make it easier to find it. Okay, I'll do that. All right, guys. Uh, so next week, it's Alan. And I'm thinking uh, one week I'd like to talk about um, – Jimson and I were talking about – Jimson sent me a really good book. Uh, get, get, let me get it quickly. Okay. While he's gone, Jimson – Yes. You're going to do something on nutrition. Yes. Um, yeah. That that yes. is go- uh, that would be very good as well. I think. This book. Yep. Here. That's on my list. Supplements. That's on my list. I think it was supplements. Supplements. Yeah. Supplements. Yeah. Supplements. That would be good. Can you okay. guys see this lifespan? Why we age and why we don't have to. Ah, oh, you bought the book. Oh man. Oh, I, I got two copies. I I am I'm a crazy. Why do I have two copies? If I really like a book, one I do all the highlighting. The other one stays pristine. There you go. One that gets all the highlighting. Yeah. One that gets the highlighting gets the dot. Anyways, but the thing is, certains is a topic that I think would be very, very important uh, to talk about. Okay. I'll add it to the sheet. We will. um... It's all about aging. Sorry, Richie. 
<laughs> you know, you know what aging is, and we're going to end off on this note. Aging is a low grade inflammatory response. And that's been proven. Ooh. Here's, here's what I, I, we can close it with this. I, my mom went from 80 to 85 down like every step of the care it just got worse and worse. I had uh, dementia and just, you know, health went down. And I learned then, you know, you, your 20s, you're invincible, you're young, your 30s, you start thinking, okay, exercise to stay young. Your 40s, you're trying to really stay young. Your 50s, you want to get young again. And then I realized the goal in life is to get older. And you got to get good at getting older because the alternative sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's like getting younger isn't a good purpose. Getting older well is a good purpose. Mm -hmm. All right. Have a look at those figures between Biden and Trump. You'll be amazed. Biden, oh. 243, Trump, 214. All right, I'm sending this email saying, send the stuff, Nikos, and let's just send that, your graphic again on it. Okay. All Sounds right, guys. guys. See you guys. Next week. Right, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you everybody. Bye. 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 Take care, guys. Bye. Bye. Good night, Rich. Welcome.